the cutoff frequency is measured when the output signal goes 3 dB below the value within the passband region. Hi there! That was an example of audio filter, in that case used for the theremin project, which you can watch starting at the link provided right now on the upper right corner. Filters are used in electronics in a multitude of applications, in audio systems, in radios, TVs, as part of oscillators and so many other places. But what are filters exactly? How do we analyze them? How do we design them? These are some of the questions I will try to answer in this new series of tutorials that starts today. Today we will go through some generalities about filters to frame the subject and provide some terminology that will help us later describe the concepts behind all filters. I will stay away from math as much as I can, but in those few cases where I really need it, please bear with me. I promise I'll do my best to keep it simple so no one gets bored. Before diving into the details, please take a few seconds to subscribe to this channel and to click the bell icon to receive notifications when new videos are published. The subscription will also help in making this channel grow and serve you better. And now, let's begin. Filters are elements used in various engineering disciplines, from optics to hydraulics, mechanics and electronics. In each of these contexts, filters are made differently, but their main purpose remains the same, to eliminate something that we don't need or don't want, and keep the rest. In our electronics context, filters are usually related to frequencies. We have a signal of several frequencies all mixed up, and we want to remove some or most of them. And then, depending on how we want to remove the frequencies, we can identify different kind of filters. If we want to remove all the frequencies above a certain one, we use a so-called low-pass filter, which will allow all the frequencies lower than the one we don't want. If we want to remove all the frequencies below a certain one, then we talk about high-pass filters. If we want to remove all the frequencies but a few centered around a specific one, we use a band-pass filter, and vice versa, if we want to keep all the frequencies but a few, we use a band-stop filter. All these drawings refer to the filter types I just mentioned. On the x-axis we have the frequency, and on the y-axis we have the level of the signal. If we call FC our cutoff frequency, the one that defines the point where the filter changes its behavior, we can represent some graphs like this how all kind of filters work. And so on the first graph, the low pass filter, all the frequencies below FC are left with their amplitude unaltered, and all the ones above FC have an amplitude of zero, and so they are removed. In the second graph, the high pass filter, it is the other way around, all the frequencies that are eliminated are the ones below the cutoff frequency. And you can now see how the other two filters, the band pass and the band stop, work. The first let all the frequencies in the limited space at the center stay, while all the others will be removed, and the opposite for the band stop filter. But unfortunately these diagrams, although simple, are impossible to obtain in the real world, and that is why we call them diagrams for ideal filters. Real filters, due to a number of factors, do not behave like that, and so they have different behavior than the ideal filters. Here is one possible representation of a real low-pass filter. This one is for the high-pass filter, then a band pass filter, and finally a band stop filter. We will learn later in the tutorial why the behavior of real filters is not the same as the ideal ones. We will also see how we can design filters that can get closer and closer to the ideal behavior, although they become more and more difficult to design and also costlier. And we will also see that getting closer to the ideal behavior has other consequences. The design of filters is a huge chapter in electronics engineering. In these tutorials I will give you an idea of all the concepts and difficulties that an engineer needs to face during design. And we will also go through some of the design techniques so you will be able to design your own filters. Don't worry about that, although the subject is extensive, some of the design techniques are not difficult at all and are perfect to be described in this series of tutorials. 
for other techniques and for more complex filters, I will give you pointers of available online calculators that will allow you to design some of the most complex of these filters without making any calculation. Filters need to be approached from two different perspectives, their analysis and their design, the so-called synthesis. The analysis of the filters can be conducted with simple methodologies, like the usage of the Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law, or we can use more sophisticated procedures that generate equations that are better suited to be solved by calculators or computers, like mesh and nodal analysis. I will show you some of these analysis methods, but only at a high level. Instead, I will pay more attention to formulas that can be easily used to find things like the cutoff frequency and the bandwidth. An example would be the determination of the cutoff frequency of a simple low pass filter, like this one in the picture. The only two variables in this filter are the value R of the resistor and the value C of the capacitor. Known these two values, we can calculate the cutoff frequency, for example, which is given by this formula. It's 1 over 2 pi RC. How simple is that? The sign of the filters, on the other end, is the inverse process. We know what we want and we need to figure out the kind of filter to satisfy our needs, as well as determining the most appropriate values for its components. Because of the large variety of filters, the design process can be sometimes tricky, but a number of methodologies help us find our way in that mess. Several standard topologies already exist, and for each one, depending on how close the filter needs to be to the ideal case, several approaches can be used to evaluate the value of the components making the filter. I'm sure you have heard names like Chebchev, Butterworth, Bessel, Elliptic, these are all different approaches for the calculations of the filter parameters. Later in this series of tutorials, we will take a look at the most important ones, and we will see how to easily make the necessary calculations, often with the help of a computer running a program that has been designed to do just that. Transfer functions are very useful when working with filters, because they give a quick idea of how the filter itself works. We will work a lot with them, and so let me tell you right now what they are by using an example. Let's start with the usual very simple circuit made of a resistor and a capacitor. And let's call VI the input voltage and VO the output voltage. Let's also call R the resistance of the resistor and XC the reactance of the capacitor. The resistor and the capacitor in these conditions form what is called a voltage divider and for that we can write that VO equals XC over R plus XC times VI, which we can also write in this other way as a VO over VI equals XC over R plus XC. This ratio is what we call the transfer function of the filter, and since the reactance of the capacitor is a function of the frequency, so is the transfer function, which we can now call H, and we can write it this way, H of F equals XC over R plus XC. The drawing of these filters, which we have seen, are in fact the graphical representation of the transfer function made on the Cartesian coordinates H and F. You will see in later videos how this transfer function is very important, both to analyze the filters and to design them. Here are a few terms that you should become familiar with. We will use these terms a lot during the next videos of this series. The first one is the so-called frequency response. It refers to the capability of a filter to let pass a certain range of frequencies and attenuate all the others, up to the point that they can entirely disappear from the output of the filter. Frequency responses identify the type of filter, detailing what is its expected behavior. And so, a frequency response for a low-pass filter will be such that all the frequencies below the cutoff frequency will pass unaltered and all the others will be attenuated. A frequency response for a high-pass filter will be the opposite. All the frequencies above the cutoff frequency will pass unaltered from the input to the output, while all the frequencies below that will be attenuated. For a band-pass filter instead, the allowed frequencies will be around a frequency named the center-pass frequency. The further away you go from this frequency, the higher is the attenuation. 
The frequency response for the band stop filter is the opposite of the band pass filter. This time, the filter allows all the frequencies but the ones centered around the so-called rejection frequency. Another interesting frequency response is the one of the notch filter. This filter behaves like a band stop filter, but the band is very, very narrow. We also have a frequency response that increases and decreases periodically with the frequency, which is called the COMB filter. We will talk about it later in this series of tutorials. And finally, there is a filter category that has a constant frequency response, or in other words, it lets all the frequencies to pass. What would be the need for such a thing then? Well, simply put, such a filter acts only on the phase of the sine waves composing the input signal. It changes the phase of the signal differently for different frequencies. It is used in a number of applications, mostly those that require such specific property, oscillators for example. Another the term that we will mention very often, and actually we already did, is the cutoff frequency. This one is the frequency usually represented with FC at which the behavior of a filter suddenly changes. For a low pass filter, for example, the cutoff frequency is the one after which the filter starts attenuating the signal, while for a high pass filter is the one before which the filter attenuates the signal. Another important name to remember is the roll off, which represents how fast the attenuation changes when the frequency changes. In math, we call this the slope of the curve, which for filters is usually measured using logarithms given the wide range of frequencies we normally deal with. When talking about band pass and band stop filters, another recurring term is the transition band, or simply the bandwidth, which describes how large or narrow is the shape of the transfer function of the filter. Next term is the ripple. The shape of the transfer function of certain filters is affected by a certain undulation right before or after the cutoff frequency, sometimes both. That happens, for example, when working with Chebyshev filters. The measure of this undulation, which is used during the design of the filter itself, is the ripple. And finally, the last term I would like to mention at this time is the order of the filter. The order of a filter is directly related to the degree of the polynomials at the numerator and denominator of the transfer function. Before concluding this tutorial, let me mention the last categorization that we will encounter during the series. This categorization is tied to the technology used to make the filter itself, and although I am sure you know already about it, it is still worth mentioning it here at the end of this tutorial. Whenever a filter is made only of passive components, like resistors, capacitors and inductors, it is called a passive filter. Its peculiarity is that it will always provide an output signal that at best will be equal to the input signal, or otherwise more or less attenuated. In other words, its gain, or ratio between the max amplitude between the output and the input, is always less than 1. But a filter can also be made of at least one active component, like a transistor or an op-amp, that act as an amplifier with a negative feedback that produces the necessary attenuation at the desired frequencies. These kind of filters are called active, and they could output a signal that has a greater amplitude of the input signal. However, they are normally designed to provide at most a gain of 1 to reduce the chances to trigger unwanted oscillations. Since I already have given you enough information to cause a headache, I will stop the discussion right now before you get too bored. Next time, we will start fresh taking one step at a time in this field that sometimes seems neglected in schools and colleges, and we will start talking with more details about low pass filters. Thank you for watching the video, and please give it a thumb up, which will help improving its visibility so others can enjoy it too. And finally, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already, so you can be automatically notified of new videos. A small monetary contribution will also help me in making more and better videos for your enjoyment. Details are in the description below. See you in the next video, and as usual, happy experiments!